I'm Jolly Pearsall. I'm the director of the Indiana IEP Resource Center, and I'm here with Marcy Wilburn and Patrick McGinley that you also hear from today. Uh, I'm going to kind of just kick us off and start by going over kind of what our learning objectives are for today. Um, we're going to be sharing some research with you today that supports um, inclusion and we also are, are going to be sharing some information about um, how we promote shared responsibility and equitable access. Um, we have a couple studies from Indiana that Patrick is going to share. And um, we have information from some, some other research um, that has been done from some consultants that we work with uh, around um, the nation. And, um, think you will find it very helpful and um, maybe convincing colleagues or um, sc school administrators that you know in inclusion is um, something that we all should be doing because it will benefit our students with disabilities. And then we're also going to share um, about some uh, the MTSS framework, which is kind of the framework that we use when working with school districts and helping them uh, figure out what it is they need to do to help improve outcomes for students, but also outcomes for um, all students, not just students with disabilities. So next slide, Patrick. So the, the Indiana IEP Resource Center um, is a state funded grant from the Indiana Department of Education. And we've been in existence since 2003. We are a TA center. And our main purpose is to work with Indiana educators and administrators and help them increase their skills, knowledge and capacity to improve outcomes for students with disabilities. But um, because of that, that we also end up working with um, gen ed administrators and teachers because we do believe in a shared responsibility between gen ed and special ed and equitable access for for all kids um, we also believe in a strong core curriculum for for all students and high quality instruction um, so just to share with you a little bit about some of our services we do um, train and we support the Indiana's online IEP system. We also, um, the, the Department of Ed has uh, deemed us the, the center that does technical assistance for LRE and for school improvement with schools that are struggling with their students with, of disabilities, um, having the outcomes that the state would like for them to have. We also do facilitate IEP services for schools and, and parents. And I just wanna say all of our resources because we are state funded um, are free to anyone in Indiana to, to use, but also to free all, to all of you that anything that is on our website. Um, next slide, Patrick. So we're gonna see who's here today. Um, Patrick is gonna put up a poll and just let you indicate what your role is. And so but just give us a chance to see a little bit about what's going on. I mean, um, I taught special education for over 30 years before I started doing grant work. Um, and Marcy and Patrick will be able to share it with you. Patrick is definitely our data research guru. Um, and Marcy also has a gen ed special ed background. So we can see that the majority of people that are here today are special ed teachers. Um, and uh, we have a few of several of the other positions represented here as well. So I'm going to go ahead and, Patrick, can you close that, the poll? All right, I, I think I have to. Sure 
Yeah, there you go. Okay. So right now we're going to watch a, a short, uh, I think it's five minutes or less, video from Shelley Moore on the evolution of inclusion. And then I'll share a, a few comments with you. Welcome to five more minutes, useful videos in five minutes or less that support the teaching and learning of all students. I'm your host, Shelley Moore. Today's topic is the evolution of inclusion. Okay, so you remember the dots? I know, I know, I know. I've shown you these before. But one colleague of mine suggested to me once, he goes, what if we didn't look at these as different concepts that we compare to each other, but instead as an evolution of time? It was totally brilliant. Now we can look at this timeline through the lens of any marginalized population, but to understand this timeline from the inclusion and disability perspective, we have to go back in time a little bit. Many of us know or are connected to someone who experienced institutionalization. It was even recommended to families by doctors. Although British Columbia was the first province in Canada to close down their institutions, there are still individuals living in these conditions across Canada today. The institutionalization movement is an example of exclusion. It separated individuals with disabilities from their families without choice. But the disability rights movement over the past 50 years, with the hard work of some incredible self-advocates and families, and maybe a little help from Geraldo Rivera, pushed communities to shift so that individuals of all abilities were welcomed and living in the same settings as their family and friends. This shift from institutions to communities, this was the start of the inclusive evolution. We have movement, but can we do better? Although many individuals are no longer excluded from their families and communities, they were, and let's be honest, they still are, expected to attend segregated schools or self-contained special education programs that are totally separate from the rest of the school community. And so parents started to ask some very good questions. You see, children with disabilities have siblings without disabilities, and families wanted all their kids to have equitable access to community-based education together. Kids started to be integrated into classrooms with their peers. They're in math together. They're in gym class together. They're eating lunch together. Kids are together. This is better. The shift from segregated to integrated schools and classrooms, this is the next step in the evolution of inclusion. We have movement, but can we do better? Well, this is where things get tricky because integration, it doesn't take long to realize that just being together, it's not enough. Although in the same classroom, students with disabilities are often just that, they're physically in the classroom. They may sometimes have parallel activities, but mostly it's loosely connected classroom tasks. Now you don't need me to tell you that just physically sharing space and time is enough to make you feel like you belong in a community. I mean, come on, there are Disney movies made about this. Breathing the same air is not enough. Do you remember the Titans? I do. The evolution from integration to inclusion is now the topic of many conversations in communities and schools around the world. How do we support individuals to be meaningfully included and not just physically integrated? It's not just about where kids go in their day, but why? What is the purpose to the places that they go? It's now school-based teams and staff that are asking questions about how to do this. How can we support purposeful and meaningful placements for kids with disabilities? In inclusive classrooms and schools, students aren't just present, but they have roles and responsibilities in their classrooms and also meaningfully connecting to their peers. This is inclusion. So there you have it, my friends. A brief history of inclusion in about five minutes. If this is interesting to you though, definitely investigate your local history as well because every community is in a different place in this journey and it's so valuable to know where we've come from. The other thing though is looking at these visuals as a timeline, it really helped me to shift my own thinking from which bubble am I at or not at and shift to more about where are we now in our inclusive journey and what's our next step. All of a sudden, the goal of inclusion becomes action-oriented and just feels so much more possible. We may not all be at the same place in the journey, but we can all move forward. We can do better. And so this is the question I'm gonna leave you with today. Can we still do better? Do you think there's another evolution in inclusion? What might that be? How can we inch even more forward to make inclusion even better? Thanks, Geraldo.
I'm not sure how many of you are familiar with Shelly Moore, but she does these great videos on different um, topics and we found them very help, helpful in, in working with um, schools and teachers. So you might wanna check out some more of, of her things. And she has a great book that Marcy's gonna mention later. But um, just to give you a, a quick, um, if you're wondering what Geraldo Rivera did, he actually reported about Willbrook State School, which was an institution in New York. And because he exposed the horrible conditions of what students and adults with disabilities were living in, it really did lead to the instrumental legislation that was passed so that students with disabilities started uh, being educated in school. So um, it's interesting to read about, but I didn't want you to th sit there and wonder what it was if I, I give you the, the brief version. Um, one thing with um, this video that we really wanted you to capture is that there are different ways of looking at inclusion. And um, one of the things that, that we've done in working with school districts, if we've, we've used what we call a strength-based model rather than that deficit model. So if you look at, and you start with the strengths that students have, um, then you can really teach the diversity of everyone in the classroom. And that model really can um, take you um, to be able to start closing that achievement gap and take you away from just looking at deficits. So I know you're probably all in a different place in the journey to the inclusion, just like we are here in Indiana. Um, but, and here are just some, and I'll share this briefly, but things that inclusion is and inclusion is not. Um, I mean, we know that educational equity and access is important, but it's also not enough. Uh, we, now we, we really need students to be more than just sitting in the classroom. We really want them to be engaged and have meaningful um, uh, interactions with their peers, uh, feel a sense of belonging and believe that all, we do believe that all students can learn. And that's a philosophy or a belief that um, sometimes it takes a while for educators to get to that point. But um, I think every teacher wants all students to learn. And then it's breaking down those silos between gen ed and special ed, um, maybe between teachers and administrators. Um, but just to, and parents and teachers or um, school board. Um, everyone that's involved in the education of students needs to be working together and have that shared responsibility. And then things that inclusion is not, um, it's not just having a student in gen ed with an aid. It's, it's not that dump and hope. Uh, mainstreaming is not enough. Students shouldn't have to earn their right to be there. Um, and again, it's not just for compliance. So next, I'm going to turn the next portion over to Patrick. All right. Thanks, Jolly. Um, as Jolly mentioned, I'm the research director for the Indiana IEP Resource Center. I'm going to walk you through a little bit of the research. We're going to talk about some statistics, and then we'll get into some of those uh, the inclusive practices that Marcy's going to kind of lead us into. So as I'm sure many of you are aware, there's, there's quite a bit of evidence that supports uh, improved outcomes for not only students with disabilities, but also students without disabilities when an equity-based inclusive education model is in place, either school-wide or district-wide. Um, we see improvements not only in academics, but also in social and emotional learning and behavioral outcomes as well. Um, and these positive outcomes are seen also in students needing extensive supports and those that have intellectual disabilities or developmental disability labels. So this is really a benefit for all students. And the research goes into more detail on this. And um, as we mentioned earlier, you can check out the articles that we've added to the Google Drive folder. They go a little more in depth on those. I know sometimes it's difficult to kind of seek those things out on your own. I've, I've had plenty of uh, trouble trying to Google some of those articles that I've I thought I'd seen an article that talked about this connection and, and I'm not able to find it. So hopefully that's at least gives you a good starting point there. Um, and one thing you might notice with some of the research is 
that the transformation to inclusive education can sometimes take quite a bit of time and effort. It's, it's really about having those strong relationships and that strong shared vision of inclusion to really help create a culture that really truly embraces equity and inclusion as part of its DNA. Um, but it really all starts with location. That's really the first step is physically including students with disabilities in general education spaces. And we'll take a look at one study that sought to examine the relationship between the physical inclusion of students in the gen ed setting and students' academic outcomes. Um, so this was conducted by uh, Indiana University, some of our colleagues, a few years ago, looking at the impact of inclusion on academic outcomes for students with IEPs. Uh, this was a longitudinal study. So what they did was they gathered some baseline ELA and math performance data on Indiana's high stakes state assessment for all students with disabilities across the state of Indiana in third grade. And they tracked their progress on ELA and math every year through eighth grade. Um, and one thing they added was a, a bunch of demographic variables for every student to see if it may have had an impact on predicting the academic performance of the student. And methodology that they used was called propensity score matching. So that's essentially where they're taking all of these variables, these demographic variables that they have, um, attendance rates, socioeconomic status, um, ethnicity, gender, looking at primary disability, um, suspension and expulsion rates, looking at all of these for every student and then comparing their baseline scores on ELA and math to their scores every subsequent year through eighth grade. Um, and with this methodology, they're finding a statistical twin for every student in a high inclusion setting and in a low inclusion setting based on those matching variables. So they're basically finding that statistical twin. Um, the high inclusion setting in this study is defined as um, the LRE category where students are spending 80% or more of the day receiving gen ed instruction right, in that general education environment. So anything less than that was considered a low inclusion setting. And so what they found was that students in the high inclusion setting scored better on ELA and math for every one of these analyses. So that's for every primary disability that they found, every combination of all these variables, including their, their baseline scores. These students had the same baseline scores, the same primary disabilities, um, but they were in different settings. And, it, and what they were able to, to tell here, based on the analysis, is that yeah, location does matter. Inclusion does matter. We know it's it's not the only thing that matters. It's what we do with the instruction in the curriculum um, when we're including those students in those environments. But really the first step is, is just getting them in there. Just giving them access is going to have at least some benefit, right? And in, in all but two of these analyses, the results were significant. Now, there's another study they conducted, which was really just an extension of this initial study where they looked at, they were looking beyond eighth grade. So they looked at high school outcomes. They used eighth grade data as essentially their baseline data, looking at the same thing, students with IEPs across the state of Indiana. So huge sample that they're working with. Um, and then comparing their baseline data in eighth grade on ELA and math to their performance on, uh, in 10th grade on ELA and math and looking at graduation rates. Um, they use the same student level matching variables they did in the previous study, but they also added some school level matching variables. And I think that was based on some of the feedback they'd received from the initial study asking, well, what about, you know, some of the equity or resource issues that might exist in the schools or the districts where these students are being served? So they added these school level matching variables to the individual students as well, looking at the percentage of students in the building that have um, that received free and reduced price meals, looking at the racial and ethnic composition of the schools. And they had very similar findings. Um, students that were in the high inclusion setting scored better on 10th grade ELA and math assessments. Those in the high inclusion setting also were more likely to graduate. Students that were in the low inclusion setting were more likely to receive graduation waivers. And all of these uh, differences were highly significant. So, I think that's a very important study. Um, and there are other studies that are out there. I, I know there was one up in the Pacific Northwest that was looking at something very similar. And I was, I was not able to find it, but maybe some of you are more, more familiar with it. 
Um, so what we're going to do here is just take a few minutes to go through this short activity, just to get your perceptions on some statistics regarding students with disabilities. And what we're going to look at here is national data. I'm gonna deploy a poll that has six questions. It's all in one poll. So I'm gonna ask you to just take a few minutes to respond to all of those questions at once. Um, and then we'll walk through those results. We'll just quickly look at the correct answers and then we can kind of move ahead. Um, but I think that's probably gonna be the quickest way to get through this. So I'm going to go ahead and launch it. And remember, this is national data we're looking at here. Okay, so let's go through the first question here. What percentage of the total public school enrollment receives special education services under IDEA? So students with IEPs, essentially. So let's see what we... Poll. Um, looks like I'm sharing results from every one of these questions, but that's okay. Um, the, the number one guess here was 14%. So I'll stop sharing. I think I've been told that when I share the results, it takes up your whole screen or it's difficult for you to see what's on my screen. Um, so I may just kind of tell you what the, what the number one response is as we go through these. So 14% was correct. That was 29% of you selected that, that uh, re response, 14%. So 14% of all students from the total public school enrollment has, has an IEP essentially. Um, and I looked up some statistics for Oregon and it's right around 14. I think it was 14.2 or something. So something very close to that. Um, so the second question, um, what percentage of school age students in the US IEP have a cognitive or intellectual disability? Let's see what I see in the poll. It's like we're tied at 6.8% and 11.8%. Uh, the most common answers there. Let's see where we were. Looks like 6.8%. So 6.8%, little under 7% of school age students in the US with an IEP, of that 14% that have an IEP, have a cognitive or intellectual disability. And I want to note that those with the most significant cognitive or intellectual disabilities um, is going to be a much smaller portion of that, of that group of students. As many of you are aware, I know there are many special educators here are probably aware of this, but those that, are, that do not work in special ed may not be aware that this is a, those with severe or significant intellectual disabilities is, is less than a third, usually in most districts, it's, it's probably about less than a third of those students that have um, that label of cognitive or intellectual disability overall. I think mild usually accounts for a half or at least two thirds, and then moderate's gonna be a little, a little smaller and, and severe's gonna be even smaller than that. Um, okay, so, and here's the distribution by disability. Um, specific learning disability, probably not a surprise to many of you, that's gonna be the highest. That's about a third, 34% of all students with IEPs um, they're receiving services. Speech or language impairment, 19%. Other health impairment, 14%. So with those three combined, those three high incidence disabilities, we're already at two thirds of all students with IEPs. Then we get down to some of the more, um, the less common or low incidence disabilities and we see where intellectual disability lies there. It's around 6%. I know I had 6.8 in the last one. So this may have been a different year looking at 6%. Um, in Oregon, I believe it was closer to 5%, so it's a little bit lower. Um, one thing I did notice when I was looking up some of the stats in Oregon was that uh, SLD accounted for 30% of students with IEP. So SLD identification is a little bit lower. And in looking at the trend data over the past several years, it looks like it decreased by about 4% over the past five years. So that may be a result of some of the early intervention programs that you have in place. I'm sure many of you are, are more aware than I am of, of what's actually going on in your state, but you know, a lot of times we are seeing that an increase in the, in the population, at least as the proportion of the students with IEPs that are served in a lot of states. Um, so it is interesting that there was a decrease there. Um, and it was, I think, a pretty small percentage of students had developmental delay as well uh, compared with the the national average of 7% of, uh, that we're seeing here. But point I'm really trying to make here is intellectual disability. Um, those students that may have difficulty um, 
comprehending some of the content, having, having some of those cognitive issues or intellectual issues that are preventing them from understanding and comprehending those, that grade level material, that's a very small percentage of the students that actually have IEPs and receiving services. So the next question, what Patrick, we do are... have a, before you go on to this, we do have a question that I'm not sure that you'll know the answer to, but um, someone in the chat posed, what is the percent of ED in Oregon? Mm -hmm. I actually, I didn't make a note of that. So I'm not sure how that compares with the, with the 5% that we were seeing um, at the national level. So I would imagine because SLD is a little bit lower, that may have bumped the others up a little bit. I did note, I think speech and language was maybe a little over 20, 21%. OHI was maybe 15 or 16%. So that may just be impacted by the lower SLD identifications. It's possible. Good question. Um, so the third question, what percentage of the total public school enrollment has an intellectual disability? So we're really just looking at what, that 6% of that 14%. So it's really just the arithmetic school. What do we guess? Um, total public school enrollment, number three, looks like 2.8 was selected as the 37% the of these selections we talked about before, most common selection. So it's, it's 0.8, so it's it's very small. This is a very small portion of the population in general. And just to reiterate, even those students with the most significant severe intellectual disabilities is going to be even smaller than that. So it's a, it's a fraction of a percentage point, a very small fraction of that most of the time in most schools and districts. Um, so question four, what percentage of students with disabilities are at or above proficiency in reading and math? Um, so we're looking at the proficiency of these students. What do we think? Um, we had fourth grade and eighth grade examples for reading and for math. 50% um, of you guessed fourth grade, 12% reading language arts, and 16% math. So let's see where we are. Looks like that's, that's about right, yeah. That's, and I don't know if we had, it looks like we didn't have one for eighth grade, but that's okay. So 12% for reading, 16% for math. So is that, that looks pretty low, but how does that compare to gen ed students? That's probably your question right now is, you know, what's the, what's the proficiency gap? And we'll take a look at that in a minute. Um, it seems pretty low, right? And um, with eighth grade looking at 10% reading and 9% math, so math dropped a little bit in the eighth grade. So now it's actually slightly below what reading was in in fourth grade, they're both, they both dropped actually. So, and another thing we wanna mention is with the, the work around school improvement and targeted support and improvement and the additional targeted support and improvement, um, having the school accountability ratings, looking at those subgroups or student groups and demographics for those various indicators, um, we noticed that Pretty much across the board, students with disabilities really tend to be the lowest performing subgroup when you're comparing to, you know, free and reduced price meals, free race ethnicity, looking at English learners, students with disabilities tend to be kind of, kind of that common denominator where, where they're, not, they're not doing as well as the others most of the time. So what does that gap look like? Or, and are we closing that gap? So this is looking at fourth grade reading. On the left side, we have students with disabilities. On the right side, we have um, non-disabled students or non-disabled peers. So looking just at the trend data since around 2000, we were at what, 9%? And then it increased incrementally a couple points and then maybe it went back down and back up again. But we're, we got to 12% from 8%, essentially 8 or 9%. Um, and on the gen ed side, we were at 30%, 31% it looks like, um, going up to, in 2017, 40%. So there was quite a bit of growth there. Um, and it looks like there may have been more growth for those students that did not have disabilities. So is the gap closing? I don't know if it's expanding necessarily, but it definitely doesn't look like it's closing overall. And what about eighth grade? You kind of see the same thing here, right? maybe a little bit less growth because they were starting a little bit higher um, for students that did not have disabilities, but they're at around 40% now compared to that 10%. And there really hasn't been a whole lot of growth, just a few percentage points for students with disabilities. So we're not really closing the gap. It doesn't seem like. 
um, fourth grade math, um, we did see quite a bit of growth early on, and then it actually dropped off. It was at 19% of its peak in 07, 09, and then it went back down a couple of points, and now we're at 16%. Whereas for the Gen Ed counterparts, we seem to see some pretty steady growth, and then it kind of leveled off in the, in the mid 40s. So it doesn't really look like it for ELA or for math and for any of these grades that we're really closing the gap necessarily. So now let's take a look at, and I don't think we added this to the poll, but what percentage of students with IEPs take the alternate assessment? So the kids that are not being held to grade level standards, they're being held to alternate standards. What do we think? We would normally expect this to be a pretty small percent of the, of the population because as many of you know, this is alternate assessment is really supposed to be reserved for those students with the most significant intellectual disabilities. But what do we know about that group? That what's the percentage of that group as, as a proportion of the total students with IEPs? That's around what, 6%? So we should see less than that, right? Because 6% was all, the total percentage of students with all intellectual disabilities regardless of the level of severity, and we're at 9%. We're at 8.9% for reading and for math. So it does look like there are probably quite a few students that are that are being held to alternate standards who may be intellectually capable of learning, but maybe they just learn a little bit differently than the way that we're teaching. And so, you know, these are the conversations we really need to be having in our schools is thinking about, okay, these students can learn. They can learn the content. We know what the research says, but if they're not learning the way that we're teaching, a lot of times we decide, okay, well, we're just going to hold them to different standards or we're going to have somebody else deal with them because that's not really the way we teach in the gen ed setting. And, and it's, it's difficult for us. And it's going to be very hard for us to think about reorganizing the way we're doing things and, and restructuring those things and, and uh, using and embracing different practices than what we're used to. So we need to take all that into consideration when we're having those conversations. Um, I had one more question. Looks like it didn't get added to the poll either. Um, and th that was probably my mistake when I sent these questions out. Um, question six, what percentage of students with disabilities are spending 80% or more of the day in the regular classroom in the ed setting? So we're looking at least restrictive environment. We're looking at an inclusion here. So let's look at that percentage. It looks like it's 63.5%. So is that higher or lower than what you would expect? Documents is filled out for each um, district. Looks like in Oregon, I was able to find a relatively current percentage and it looks like it's about 75%. So it's a little bit higher. I think Indiana is pretty close to that as well. It's a little higher than the national average. Um, but nationally, we're looking at 63%. So What's the trend been over the past several years in LRE, particularly with the students that are served in that environment? Um, nationally, it looks like back in 2000, we were a little bit below 50%, and now we're a little bit above 60, at that 63, 63 and a half percent. So there has been some growth. There certainly has been some growth, but when you look at this chart, it looks like around 2010, it's kind of leveled off. It's increased incrementally, very small, but not a whole lot. So it might appear that this is the best we could do. This is the most inclusive that we could be. And I don't know if that's necessarily the case. Um, so we need to be thinking about, you know, what can we do in our environments? How can we restructure things? How can we rethink the way that we're educating students in that gen ed environment so that we can expose more students with IEPs or students in general to that curriculum? so that we can hold them to those standards and, and they can um, spend as much of the day as possible um, receiving an education in that general environment. So this leads us to this final question that we're asking and we don't have a whole lot of time. So I'm probably not gonna give a whole lot of time to, to answering this question necessarily, but think about these things. What are the factors that might impact whether a student with an IEP would benefit from an increase in the amount of time that they're spending in the gen ed setting? Or what are some of those barriers that might prevent that from happening? We know we wanna get these students in that placement. We know that it's a good thing for students and what, that's what the research tells us, but what else can we do? And Marcy's gonna get into to some of those, what else we can we do type things. Um, so 
we always really like to start these conversations when we're working with teams talking about beliefs. If these are the beliefs that we really want to have in place, we want these to be present in our educational environments, we need to be able to envision them. So we really need to be think about, thinking about what do these look like? What does it look like when every child learns and achieves the high standards? And when we're really talking about every child, regardless of what their disability is and regardless of what their needs are, what does that look like? What does that feel like? What does that sound like? Um, learning includes academic and social competencies, making sure that we're addressing the social and emotional needs. And are we intentionally incorporating the social emotional learning aspects into the curriculum rather than just having that as a standalone program? Every member of the education community can, continues to grow, learn, and reflect. So we have that growth mindset. And every member of the education community is responsible for every child. Um, so I'm gonna just give you a minute to take a look at the, these questions, or I guess these, these beliefs, these four beliefs that we have outlined in our Padlet site and just jot down, you're able to post in the little post-its on the Padlet site. I'm gonna add this to the chat window for you so you can access it directly. Um, so you can basically enter what your responses would be, what you think this would look like, feel like, or sound like if you saw this in your building. Or if you're already seeing these things present in your buildings already, what does that look like, feel like, or sound like? And think about the, from the perspective of you, from any educator in the building, from any administrator, support staff, what about the students? What would this look like or sound like or feel like to the students or the parent or any, any stranger who just shows up in the building? What would that look like to them? I see all children are engaged. All kids getting access to core instruction, absolutely. The child's social emotional needs are addressed. Authentic instruction in reading and math and science. Ownership of students on IEPs, rather than it's just my students and your students, it's these are these are our students. Yes, absolutely. It's that shared responsibility. Excellent. And feel free to use these with, with your schools or with your teams as you're having conversations around inclusion. What can we what do we think these could look like? How can we envision these things? Right, no longer mine versus yours, absolutely. All teachers and specialists, right? Ableism, we need to, we need to talk about ableism, absolutely. That inherent bias that, that a lot of us might have. Adults working with children believe the children can achieve the high standards, yep. It's having that, that self-efficacy that what we're doing is actually going to have make an impact. All right, well, thank you. And, and feel free to, to continue to jot down. We might be able to take a moment at the end and, and take a look at these as well. Um, but I'm gonna go ahead and move on to kind of tying this into um, to MTSS. Um, it's important that we, we make this connection with MTSS with these inclusive beliefs because MTSS really kind of operates as the ideal framework for supporting an inclusive culture in an educational community. This graphic that you see here represents the MTSS framework that we use in Indiana. Um, MTSS is uh, incorporated into Indiana's ESSA plan. Um, and like I said, we're going to get into some evidence-based inclusive practices here in a minute, um, but in order to implement and sustain these practices and to create an inclusive environment in general, they really need a support system. And an MTSS will provide the leadership, the, the capacity, the communication, collaboration, all of that stuff, the problem solving process, all of those pieces that are needed to support an inclusive environment using evidence-based practices and ensuring that they're implemented with integrity. It's already built into this framework. So it's, it makes a very nice, easy connection there. Um, we often get a lot of questions also about when we're doing trainings on MTSS about what to do 
with the services and supports that are already being provided to teams? And where do those fit into an MTSS framework? Do they exist outside of the tiered system? Are they maybe an extension of it? Or are they, are they something completely separate on their own? Um, and the answer is, this is really a universal framework. This really encompasses everything we do for every student at all times. So there really is nothing that we do in schools that does not fit into the tiered support system. For some folks, that, that ends up being a little bit of a mindset shift, especially when we think about, well, the way we did RTI or the way we did PBIS was a little bit different. We weren't including everything in there. We weren't looking at high ability students. We weren't including students with disabilities and the specially designed instruction um, throughout the tiers. Um, so that's, that's something that we really need to consider. You know, all the services and supports and programs that you have in your schools really should be incorporated throughout all tiers of instruction and intervention. We really don't wanna overlook that. And when it comes to specially designed instruction, there are still going to be elements of SDI that occur during not only core instruction, but during any supplemental or intensive supports that are provided in tiers two and tiers three. So it really needs to be embedded in that instruction intervention that, that's occurring across or throughout the tiers. Okay, I'm gonna pass it along to Marcy and we're gonna talk about some of these practices. Hi everyone, my name is Marcy Wilburn and I'm the project coordinator of the Indiana IEP Resource Center. And we are going to build off of what Jolly was speaking of and Patrick was speaking of and talk about where, where do we start in this endeavor? Um, what should be the first things that we're looking at and where are we at now and where do we wanna go from here? Next slide, Patrick. So the, one of the things, we start with those beliefs that Patrick talked about and we really break down what does it mean for all students to be able to learn? And what does it mean for all staff in the building and all faculty and all, um, whether it be admit, um, custodians, whether it be instructional assistants, whether that be um, anyone who's there working with students are all responsible for learners. So we wanna make sure that we're really focusing on that word all and breaking it down and what does that mean? And when we're talking about all, we're really looking at what is each individual child or adult within the building, what are the things that are their strengths and what are the things that are opportunities for them to grow? And we all have areas that we excel at and we all have areas that we struggle with. So really thinking about the triangle um, in more terms of strengths would be more at that bottom level, universal. You, you don't need as many supports to be successful in that area, all the way up to that intensive level of support that's needed for you to be successful. And again, thinking not just of the student, but of the adults in the building as well. And how can we make sure that we're meeting the needs of all of those who are working with our students so that we can be most successful. Next slide, Patrick. So it may look more like this when we're talking about individual skills. And we may have a student, um, let's hypothetically talk about a student with an emotional behavioral disorder. We may look at that student's math ability and that bottom green universal excels in math, consistently gets straight A's, does not need any additional support in mathematics besides tier one instruction, is doing very well. But then when we're talking about his reading, it's actually falling more in that um, middle area, that targeted level. And he does need additional supports, maybe because he was out of the room so much for behavior difficulties that he missed some reading instruction. So that's becoming an area of need for him. And then we're looking at the top, of the red part of that triangle and that behavior, coping strategies, what to do when we get frustrated is the part that's difficult for this student. So this student is not a tier three student. He receives supports for behavior, but he has some areas of his life that he does really, really well in. And how do we capitalize on those strengths and help students to overcome those barriers that are in the way of improving some of their more intensive needs that they have? So really looking at the whole child approach and not just putting kids into tiers and labeling them with the tiers that they fall into, but noticing that this is fluid. We're gonna ebb and flow and we're gonna go back and forth and we're gonna give kids what they need when they need it. And how do we do that? Next slide, Patrick. So we're really looking at this special education as a false dichotomy. So 
typically we've had general education and we've had special education in the past and we're trying to blur those lines. We don't want it to be two separate silos. We're really looking at um, merging those together and noticing that students with disabilities, um, they definitely are eligible for services, but for every student who's eligible for services, we have another student who has very similar needs that may not be eligible for services. So these two students here, these two boys on the slide have a different status. We have one who is eligible and one who isn't, but their needs are the same. So how do we work together in order to meet the needs of both of those students? And the next slide really um, goes over, students with disabilities don't have special needs, but they do have special rights. So we have a legal obligation to provide services to students with disabilities, but we also have a moral obligation to serve all of the students who have similar needs who maybe aren't eligible. So continue to go back to that and think about all of the learners within our building. I bet you can think of two students who have similar needs, one who's eligible and one who isn't. And how do we really look to see how can we provide services to both of those students so they all get what they need, again, when they need it. And then we can fade that out over time and bring it back if it, if it needs to be put back on and those supports need to be added back into their schedule. So really thinking of all students have needs and how do we address them? We just need to note that students with disabilities have special rights. Next slide. So again, how are we gonna do this? And how is our focus gonna shift from just meeting the needs of students with disabilities to meeting the needs of all learners within our building? So the first thing we're gonna do is we're really gonna focus on tier one. Um, we have worked with the Swift Center and other resources across the country and consultants who have talked a lot about, you can't intervene your way out of bad tier one instruction. So how do we get the tier one to the level that we want it to be in order for all of our students to be as successful as they can without additional support? And once we get tier one in a good place, 80 to 85% of our kids, students being successful, then we're gonna focus on our tier two and our tier three and our special education services. Then we're gonna spend time on what do those interventions look like? What do those services look like? And how are we gonna support those learners? So tier one really needs to be in a good place. And we need to have students who have access to tier one before we move to other places. So the first three um, things that we're gonna talk about today are really gonna be what can we do in the general education classroom for all learners? And the first one is differentiated instruction, which was already mentioned in the chat earlier. So thank you for that plug ahead of time. Um, but noting that we have this diversity in our classrooms and we know that we have, the teachers have this content to teach and hopefully teachers have the skills to teach that content, but we need to recognize that these, there are differences among all of our students and this one size fits all approach is not going to work in our current classrooms. And that is what differentiation is. Um, Christina Dubay and her co-author Hockett have such great materials available. And I actually have some resources at the end of this that we'll go through, um, but it is example after example. So for all you special education teachers out there um, on this or general education teachers, it is that practical book that um, once you get your hands on, you can implement tomorrow. So we'll talk about some of those things next. Let's go to the next slide talking about what differentiation is and was it what it isn't. It's really that effective teaching and learning. It is not, the goal is not to water down standards or to take away from the content that our students are supposed to learn, but to give them opportunities to be successful in their learning and a way to reach up to the standards that we want them to get. Um, it is not something that we're gonna do every now and again, or that we have to do all the time. We're gonna use student data to determine whether we're going to do something different or if what we're currently doing is already working. So really looking at the patterns of student learning and then determining how our instruction is going to change or stay the same based on that. It's not changing every lesson plan for every single student. It's looking at either individual students or it could be looking at small groups of students to work with. But again, it's not something that you have to look at for every single lesson of every single day, but what are we doing? What are some patterns that we can create so that students have options within their learning? Um, and it really is targeting to student learning goals. How do we ensure that students know what the goal of the lesson is 
putting it in kid-friendly language so they know what they're supposed to get out of the lesson. And how do they know once they've mastered it? Are we providing feedback to know, hey, you're getting this, or hey, this is what you can do to improve. Not just good job or needs improvement, but these are the specific things that you need to do in order to make progress towards this goal, or this is what you did to be successful towards this goal. So it's really just improving that instruction for all students within the classroom. And it's not looking just at our students with disabilities. It's not target, targeting our English language students or our at-risk students. It's really looking at all students in their entirety and responding to how they're learning and how they're taking in that instruction. Next slide, Patrick. So some of the considerations, and I think the first one about the classroom community, we talked a little bit about with culture. So is there the belief that all students can learn? Do we recognize that what is fair isn't always equal? And not only do staff and teachers recognize this, but do our students recognize this? That sometimes peers need something different than I need to be successful. And that's okay because at a different time, I might need something different than they need. So making sure that we're creating this community of learners who want to um, help each other, who want each other to be successful and recognizing that we always don't always need the same thing. So then articulating those learning goals, again, making sure that they're in kid-friendly language that all of our students can understand and they know when they've met those goals. We're assessing students so that we can look at what's working, what's not working. And after we assess and we look at that data, then we're gonna adapt. And we can adapt in four different ways, sometimes multiple ways in lessons. Sometimes we just pick one of these, but we're gonna look at the content, the what we are teaching, the process, how we're teaching, the product, that end result of the student to show their learning, and the environment. Sometimes it's just the setup and the environment that needs changed in order to make a lesson successful. But those four areas can all be changed in order to better meet the needs of our students. So within these changes, we might look at student readiness. Do we need to do some pre-teaching before we start? Student interest, what's going to um, pique the student's interest um, and engage them. If I am writing a five paragraph essay, letting them pick their own topic if that's the standards that are involved. If I'm not assessing standards, maybe I look at, um, or if I'm not assessing a five paragraph essay, maybe I have them be able to share their information that they've gained via a video recording or something different like that. So looking at what their preferences are, their learning styles and their interests. All of those things need to be considered when we're talking about differentiation. The next one that we often um, talk to teachers about is universal design for learning. So when we're talking about differentiation, we're really looking at who we have in the class and we're making changes based off of how the students within our class are um, performing at any given time. Now for universal design for learning, we're looking at this framework for planning so that we're already accounting for some of the diversity that's, that we anticipate coming into our classroom. So how are we designing instruction to already meet the needs of learners? And there's goals within each pillar that we'll talk about here shortly. Can you go to the next slide for me, Patrick? So we have, for universal design for learning, we have those three pillars, multiple means of engagement. Why do I wanna learn this? Why is it important to me? How is it relevant? Multiple means of representation. What's that teacher doing to convey that information to me? How are we giving students that information so that they can understand it? And multiple means of action and expression. Again, similar to that product and differentiation. What, how are students showing what they have learned from the process or showing their knowledge base? So interestingly enough, um, multiple means of engagement was actually the third pillar. And um, CAST.org actually decided that now it needs to change to the first pillar. This has been a few years ago now because without engagement, the other two don't really matter. We have to make sure students are engaged in their learning first, then we can give them the information and then we can ask them to show what they know. But engagement is that first piece that we need to make sure kids are connected to their learning first. How do we make it important to them? Next slide, Patrick. So when we're talking about universal design for learning, um, I'm sure many of you have seen this chart before, but I really like how it breaks down each of the three pillars 
into smaller categories and then also has goals for each section. So when we're talking about engagement, again, we're gonna look at student entrance. We're going to provide options for them to persist over time. When things get hard, how do we help them reach that goal by providing that feedback? How do we make sure that students learn how to self-regulate over time and self-initiate those tasks? So the goal of engagement is really to create expert learners who understand what they need in order to be purposeful in their learning and motivated within their learning. The second pillar is that representation um, pillar, and it has to do with the perception of gaining information. So how is the teacher displaying the information for students? Is it auditory? Is it visual? Do we have images and symbols available for some of our students who might do better with pictures and adding information to text and things like that? Um, for instance, even throughout, as we were doing the activities, Patrick would say the activities, we would have them on the slide, and I would try and reiterate in the chat what needed to be done. So there were multiple ways for you to understand the directive that we were coming to, and how are we doing this for students in the classroom? Um, provide various options for comprehension. How are we ensuring that students are understanding what we're giving to them? And the purpose of this pillar of representation is to create learners who are resourceful and knowledgeable. And the last one is the action expression piece. And it's all about um, how do we know what students know? Are we able for them to show us um, through giving us responses? Are they telling us responses? Are they writing? Um, again, are they filming different things? How are they giving us the communication? And are they fluent with the information that they're sharing with us? And again, that executive function piece is so important. How are they setting the goals of what we want them to do? And if it's a big project, how are they getting there over time so that they can monitor their progress? And we really want students to become the expert learners who are strategic and goal-directed. All of this information, um, like I said, can be found at CAS and so much more is available there, but really designing the instruction from the get-go and having all of these considerations in place so that the lesson is there and ready to go for any learner that enters your, your building. Now, I will say we, we do have questions about, oh, well, is differentiation the right answer or is UDL the right answer? And I have to say that the best answer for this, I think it's on the next slide, Patrick, can you go? So um, Christina Dubé in her book, really, we thought she answered this question beautifully. So UDL is what we're doing for the entire class and we're gonna plan for it all the time. Now I will say we have teachers who are completely overwhelmed when we, when we show them what UDL is and provide them the chart. And they're like, we can't do this for every lesson of every day. And we're like, start small, do one lesson a day, consider making that, you know, planning that through the pillars of UDL. Um, and then you build your lessons over time so that they're already there. Um, and then same thing with differentiation. Well, that we're gonna respond to our student needs. So if we design through UDL and it's not working, we're still gonna have to just consider the students that we're working with and the groups of students in our classroom and how we're gonna meet their needs if some reason our planning fell short and didn't meet their needs. So I love the last line and best case scenarios, classrooms include both UDL and differentiation. Um, and I think you'll find probably varying answers to that, but I think if you're looking at it to, look, we're gonna try our best to meet students' needs from the get-go, and if we don't, we're gonna respond to their needs and, and meet them where they're at in order to best meet the needs of all the learners within our classroom. And I think that um, is definitely the mindset and the philosophy that we would want teachers to take on in order to benefit the most, um, most students that they have. All right, next slide, please. So we're gonna do a quick little video and I'm checking my watch to make sure we have enough time. So I want you to view this video. It's only a few minutes long and consider differentiation. So going back, consider the content, the process, the product and the environment that this teacher creates. Also consider means for engagement, representation and action and expression. So consider both differentiation and universal design for learning and what are those access points? How is this teacher meeting the needs of all of her learners within the classroom? All right, Patrick, go ahead and start the video. Feel free to enter your ideas in the chat or just hang on to them if that's your preference. 
That is an opinion, but Daniel gets to share his. I'm a word person. I feel great when we're all reading and discussing and writing papers. That feels super comfortable to me. But it's not successful for all my students, so I need to disrupt that for myself. Now, right before we sample it, Mick, tell everybody what is it that you need to be able to do by the end of class today. Okay, here is a job that I need. I need every person in this room to get a plastic cup. Within any single day, you'll have a variety of access points for the content, and I do find that it deepens engagement for gen ed kids, for special education kids, for all different kinds of students, because there's more to do. Like, we gotta keep it moving, otherwise it gets really boring. So it's trying to find a way where there's something that's video, where there's something that's audio, where there's something that's visual, where there's something that's read. It is about that many paths, many, many paths. Floating around, floating around. Nobody's connected to anybody else. Floating around. We're floating around. Now make one milk protein. One milk protein. I really learned how important it was to introduce more visual cues for my students who are English language learners, where you do an action related to vocabulary um, or related to a concept. We're going to stretch out, stretch out. Stretch. The learning gains that I saw for my ELL learners were so huge when I started to disrupt a purely language-based and word-based um, type of instruction. But what do I want now? Connect. 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 It matters less to me how we arrive somewhere. What matters to me is that a student develops the conceptual understanding around something. Get time. Get tight, get small, you're a tiny, tight little milk protein. I just saw my students really be able to shine. It was beautiful to watch. Okay. And relax. All right, so before we move on to co teaching, um, any comments around what that teacher did um, in terms of either differentiating her instruction or designing her lesson universally for all the learners within her classroom? What did she do well? You can put it in the chat. Um, you can unmute your mic. Um, providing modes of instruction and output that includes visual, kinesthetic, and written. Wonderful. <laughs> I think what what we talked about those learning targets at the very beginning, she had the student go over, you know, what's our goal for today? What are we learning? Having students paraphrase learning goals for each lesson. You must have been typing while I was talking. Wonderful. Becky said so much differentiation. Plus having kids learning from other kids who got it first, wonderful. That collaborative learning model, peer mentors, verbal cues did not separate anyone out as different. Yes, they weren't at the back kidney table by themselves in the classroom. They were definitely integrated within. Students who were at risk and students who struggle were integrated with their peers. There was no difference there. Creating multiple pathways to learn the content and connect with the language, wonderful. Okay. Thank you for sharing everyone. Now we can move on to co-teaching. So another, so we have differentiation in UDL and we're gonna to move to co-teaching, um, which is also one of the things that we train on across the state and in Indiana. But we really look at co-teaching as a combination of these three definitions. So two or more licensed professionals, and we really work towards these three main goals, co-plan, co-teach, and co-assess. So those three aspects are what make it co-teaching, co-planning together, co-teaching, and co-assessing. Co-teaching then is these two teachers who bring strengths and areas of need to the table, but share their expertise together to create this classroom that ensures positive outcomes for all students and so that both teachers can be successful. So we have two licensed educators that are making sure that this classroom is successful for everyone through co-planning, co-teaching, and co-assessing. 
and ensuring that all students are full members of the class. So just like the video that you just saw, although there weren't two teachers in the classroom, those students were full members of the class. They were active in their learning. They weren't just in the class, but they had meaningful participation. And that's really what we're looking for, whether it's a single teacher or a co-teaching model, but really looking at what are these two teachers bringing that can help all of our students be successful? Next slide for me, Patrick. So again, just like differentiation, just like universal design for learning, co-teaching really isn't a special education thing, but rather a best practice thing in education. We don't want it to be seen as these two teachers are in the room just to support special education students. We really wanna shift that that level of thinking to these two teachers are in the room to support everyone. And, and how can we make sure that we have two teachers who can best meet the needs of all of the students in the class? And the mindset is we're here for everybody, not your students, my students, not, oh, I'm gonna pull these students back every day, the same students because I'm in here and these students need the most support. These groups should be fluid in how we're providing services to students. So making sure that um, two people have that same level of thinking and those beliefs so that we can help students the most. Next slide. So the essential question that we always ask to our teachers and pose to our administrators are, what are these teachers doing that are substantially different and better for students than one teacher would do alone? So as we have students in the classroom um, that need our supports and we have these two teachers there, how does the instruction look different? How are we utilizing both of these people to make it worth an administrator's while to pay two salaries for those individuals to be in the room? So as we're talking about evaluating co-teachers or as we're training co-teachers, we have them consider what are you doing that's so different? And the best way to, to help teachers understand what they can be doing that's different is really looking at the approaches. So let's head to the next slide, Patrick. So when we talk about the approaches, we're gonna get into those next, but first we're gonna talk about what each teacher brings. So the general education team teacher brings that curriculum expertise. They are the ones who know the content, they know the standards, and they're really good at knowing what all, if it's a fourth grade teacher, what all fourth graders should know, right? If you're a special ed teacher and you haven't been working with special ed for very long, that, or haven't been working at the fourth grade level for very long, then you may not know what those fourth graders need to know. So really using that general education teacher's expertise to help get up to speed on that. But then the special ed teacher is gonna bring that understanding of specially designed instruction and, and their expertise in that. The general edu education teacher typically works with large groups and whole classrooms. So they understand that group management where a special education teacher brings that focus on individual students and that relationship piece with individual students. The general education teacher has an understanding of that pacing guide and knows what we have to get through, whereas the special education teacher brings that mastery mindset. And when they bring that at the beginning and they all work together, towards the end of the year, if it's a good co-teaching relationship, the lines of these start to get blurred because we're helping each other out and we're starting to learn more of what the gen ed teacher's role is and the special ed teacher's role. And now we're, we're just working together because we both have an understanding of all of these things. Next slide, Patrick. So now on to the approaches. We have one teach, one assist. And essentially one teach, one assist is just that. You have one teacher teaching and the other teacher is walking around and, and helping students managing behaviors that students might be having. Definite pros of this is two, you know, multiple people on deck to help support. However, the problem with this is um, sometimes the teacher who's assisting might be distracting um, to those other students in the classroom, might even be distracting the student who um, needs a little extra help because now they're helping with the content that was previously stated and they've missed the next content that they needed to learn. So making sure that this is done and it's appropriate, but it's not done all the time. It's really used fairly as a model. One teach, one observe um, is really talking about that collection of data and what can the teacher, was one teacher's teaching, the other teacher is collecting data, um, whether that be behavioral data, progress monitoring data, whether it's 
data on who's understanding the concepts taught or not, so that then you can move into a different approach later and figure out who's what students are going into which group. So if you have an alternative teaching model next, where students need additional support, maybe I'm taking data on who needs to come into the, the group that needs more support for that day's lesson. Parallel teaching, we're teaching the same content to two smaller groups. So each teacher has a smaller group of students. So students have more opportunities to respond. They're able to be closer to the content. They might have a better rapport relationship with the teacher and need to go into that group. So I think it's important to split the students up Sometimes we split them up purposefully, sometimes we split, split them up randomly, and we teach the same content to groups of students. Now we have to make sure that one student, one teacher is not way more fun than the other student and using manipulatives that every other student in the other group wants. Also noise level can be something that we need to pay attention to with parallel teaching, um, but it is definitely an approach that can be used often and is very effective. And it looks different than what you would see in a regular classroom. So going back to our essential question, Alternative teaching is taking groups. Um, it might be a larger group and a smaller group. It may be split evenly, but what you're teaching is a little bit different. You might be pre-teaching. You might be providing some remediation. You might be providing instruction um, that is enrichment for a group of students who are ready to move on. Um, so alternative teaching is really taking the readiness level of your students and meeting them where they're at. Station teaching is often done really well at the elementary level, and we somehow lose that at the middle school and high school level, but it's students going around to each station and being able to um, gain the content um, across the board, um, and they go to every station. You may have a teacher-led station, and you may have a student who really needs to go to that teacher-led station twice, and guess what? That's okay. They can skip another station and come to the teacher-led station twice to get the content two times in a row. That could be beneficial for a student. Maybe not all the time, but on a certain day and a certain lesson that's challenging for them, that may be where they need to be. And the last two, teaming and one teach, one make multisensory, are, are both teaming strategies, but I like to designate them out. Um, the first six are, you know, from Marilyn Friend, and she's the guru of co-teaching, and we'll tell you about these six. And the last one we add in is actually from Paula Kluth's um, books. Um, but teaming is when both teachers are up in front of the room and providing that instruction. And one teach, one make multi-sensory is a way of taking a, a team approach, but then making it a little bit more fun, adding another level um, to address the additional senses of the students. So for instance, if I'm reading about the life cycle of a plant, the other teacher might be drawing the life cycle of a plant next to me. So they get their visual, um, their active visual along with the, the lecture piece that goes along with their, the discussion piece. Um, another thing, it may be dressing up like a character or role play, all of those things so that the two teachers have separate roles in that teaming process, but really a way to engage those students. Next slide, Patrick. So those were the things that can be done in all general education classrooms, really focused on all the learners. Um, Christine said special needs students aren't the only ones who need support and she couldn't be more right. So how are we focusing on everybody? But going back to students with disabilities have special rights and we need to talk about those really quickly. And I just realized that I'm a little bit over, so I'm gonna run through these slides rather quickly. What is required for students with disabilities? So. This is the legal obligation. So we have to provide that specially designed instruction. Um, Patrick, if you wanna to go to the next slide, these are the factors about specially designed instruction um, that make it specially designed for students. So we are focusing not just on those standards, but what are the students' present levels of performance and what are the goals that we want them to reach within their IEPs? How are we focusing on the student's disability? Um, and how are we addressing those needs and those barriers from that disability so that they can learn. And that teacher is going to provide that systematic evidence-based instruction over time to those learners. In addition, Patrick, let's go to the next slide. In addition, we have accommodations and modifications that we provide to our students. Accommodations are, I'm sure you all know, but leveling that playing field, whereas modifications are changing the content or the what the student is learning. And those are the things, especially that specially designed instruction, that's that legal obligation to our students' with disabilities. 
All right, so last thing, where are you in your inclusive journey and where do you want to go next? Relating back to Shelly Moore, what's that next circle going to look like? And can you do better for students? All of the remainder of the slides, Patrick, if you just want to go to the next one, are a couple of quotes saying that inclusive mindset can start with anybody. And, and where do we want to begin with that? And then the rest are all our fave resources that we utilize. So um, Jolly mentioned at the beginning that we'd be sharing Shelley Moore's book. Here it is. Um, we used a lot of Lee and Young's information within this presentation as well and her books here. But we just went over each of the categories that we covered and provided some resources here for you. There's also handouts um, in the um, folder that you have access to as well with the PowerPoint and the handouts. So I'm reading Dave's message. He says, please remember to complete the evaluation. Um, the link is in the digital program. Thank you all for attending today. And I'm so sorry we kept you a little bit long, but thank you so much. Have a good one.